So one of the main things we want to do is create models of the yield curve. Uh, what is the pattern of yields across maturities at any given moment in time? Might be upward sloping, might be downward sloping. How do we model that? So for example, if like today, the yields of one period bonds are about one tenth of a percent, the yield of a 10 period bond is, 10 year bond is 2%, does that mean the 10 year bond is a better deal? Everybody go buy 10 year bonds. The expectations hypothesis says no. It's the version of the random walk, risk neutral, uh, the, the starting place of all finance. No, 10 year bonds are not better than one year bonds. The statement of the expectations hypothesis is 10 year bonds and one year bonds will do the same for the next year. They're expected to do the same for the next year on average. Now, how can they do the same for the next year on average if the 10 year bond has a higher yield? Well, that means interest rates must rise in the future. So the reason the yield curve is upward sloping is not because you make more money uh, in this year, it's because uh, all interest rates are gonna rise in the future. That's the, the statement of the hypothesis. It's not a fact, we'll see how it works in the data. Okay, so let's, let's state that hypothesis right. It comes from uh, the basic principle is any two ways of money, of transferring money across time, should on average give the same expected return if there are a bunch of risk neutral traders out there or, or if our bottom line is risk neutrality onto which we will add risk premiums. So let's implement that, that idea. Uh, let's suppose you want to take, get money from now to year end. Perhaps you decide you want to send your grandchildren to the University of Chicago uh, and you know tuition is going to be high so you better get some money from now until year end so you can send your children there. Well, here. <laughs> Uh, there's two ways to do it. You buy an N-year zero coupon bond or you keep it in a money market account and roll over uh, one-year rates. Uh, let's do the, what is the statement of those two things giving about the same rate of return on average? Well, the return from now until time N, that's minus the, the log return, is minus the price of the long-term bond. That's the rate of return for doing this. The rate of return for doing this is the, uh, the sum, because they're logs, the cumulative return of investing in one-year bonds throughout the project. So divide by n, and you have that the yield on the long-term bond must equal the uh, average of the, of the yields on the intermediate short-term bonds. And thus, if the long-term yield is higher than today's short-term yield, that is because people expect future short-term yields to rise. Let's think about another way of getting money transferred across different periods of time. Perhaps you're only interested in investing from now until next year, uh, and then you want to do something with it next year. Well, there's two options for you. You can hold a one-year bond for a year, or you can buy an N-year bond and then sell it next year when it has become an N minus one-year bond. If fairly risk-neutral traders are out there equalizing rates of return, the one-year yield should be the expected return on the long-term bond over the next year, or the expected excess return on all bonds over the next year should be equal to uh, zero uh, for, uh, for all different maturities. Third way you can move money around through time, you might want to move money from time n minus one to time n. Well, there's two ways to do that. Suppose you have a project, you're going to build a factory in n minus one and then it'll pay off in time n. Well, you can lock in the financing now, or maybe you can sit around and, and borrow the money when the time comes. Which one are you going to do? Well, if, if you think that uh, locking in rates now are cheaper than they're going to be in the future, lock them in. If you think it's going to be cheaper in the future, do it in the future. If there's a bunch of arbitrageurs making that decision, they're going to drive prices to those two things have on average the same rate of return. So the forward rate, that is the locking in, should be equal to the expected value of the future spot rate. Now, these seem different, they seem quite different, but in fact, they are all algebraically the same because they come from the same principle. And a fun exercise for the interested reader is to prove algebraically that each of these statements implies the other one. Uh, and you just do it by moving money, you, you, cre you synthesize one thing by lots of other things. This is a hypothesis, of course, and uh, when it doesn't work, we call the result the risk premium. This is roughly speaking risk neutrality, so maybe long-term bond yields are higher 
than the expected uh, future uh, short rates. Well, uh, we call that amount higher a risk premium, the amount that long-term bondholders earn in excess of that as compensation for risk. It's just a fudge factor. It is whatever makes the, uh, the th whatever makes the theory end up working. But at least what the theory does is it, is it separates things for us into the risk neutral part and the part that is in some sense compensation for risk. And what's interesting about fixed income is it's not obvious. Uh, when we were doing one period rates of return, of course, there was the risk-free rate and the risk premium. Here, since we have things of different maturity, these statements aren't, aren't directly obvious from the idea of all things pay the same expected return. Mm -hmm.